Hi, Dan Gemeinhardt back with another installment of Coyote Sunrise here with a special guest star, Odie. He is my, he's reluctant, he's a reluctant star. There he is. Uh, he's my writing partner. Uh, we stay home together and work on this stuff together. Um, and he's excited to be, hey Odie, Odie, hey buddy. <laughs> Uh, the uh, school closure is like the best thing that's happened in Odie's life because he gets his whole family home every day. Um, it's pretty pretty fun times for him. But I'm going to continue with Coyote's, the remarkable journey of Coyote Sunrise for our Coyote Sunrise book club. This is chapter four. I'm going to try to get the next couple posted today, and that'll be it as far as what I record. Again, for like legal and copyright and even time reasons, I can't do the whole book. Um, so hopefully, if you've been following along and enjoying it, hopefully you're able to get your hands on a copy. I know I've said this every time, but hopefully through a public library. Our public library does mail order and ebooks online and audiobooks online. Um, so I, I can't do the whole thing. I'm going to do the first, I think, I forget what spot I picked, six or seven or eight chapters. Um, and then that's all that I can do. Um, and so hopefully you can get it yourself. Um, and then I'm looking at possibly March 27th as the day to get together, which um, depending on when you see this is next Friday. I'm going to think about that. That might be too soon, especially if you haven't gotten the book yet. Um, so I'll, I'll see. But towards the end of March, early April at the latest, um, we'll get together and talk about the book. Hopefully you'll be able to finish it on your own. But here comes chapter four. So remember, Rodeo, Coyote's dad has discovered uh, Ivan, the cat. I still have Ivan with me. Um, and uh, he says we'll give the cat 500 miles. Ivan will decide whether or not we're going to keep this this cat. Um, and they're going to give this mileage test, which is something that they do. Um, so here comes chapter four of the remarkable journey of Coyote Sunrise. <clears throat> well, no surprise. I was right about just about everything. Ivan fit in with me and Rodeo like a slice of cheese between two pieces of bread. He made himself right at home, Ivan did. He slept wherever the heck he felt like and whenever the heck he felt like it. He roamed and rambled around the bus, sniffing and investigating and generally just being adorable. Now that he was out in the open, I gave him an official tour of his new home. This here is a 2003 International 3800 bus, I told Ivan, cradling him in my arms. Her name is Jaeger. Once upon a time, our home had the words Voyager Day School painted in black on her yellow sides. But when we'd bought her, Rodeo had scratched most of those letters off to give her a new, less institutional sounding name. She was long and sturdy looking, with a handsome hood sticking out in front of her like the prow of a boat. Jaeger was not one of those flat-nosed buses. No, sir. Those may be all right for getting people back and forth from school, but they're nothing that anybody would call a home. And this is the cockpit, I continued, holding Ivan out so he could see it good. He took a look at the driver's seat and the dashboard and the big old steering wheel. There was a white ceramic sculpture of a pug on the dashboard, looking out at the road before us. We called him the Dog of Positivity, and Rodeo insisted he was sort of a canine guardian angel, keeping us happy. Ivan gave him a curious sniff. Rodeo, sitting in the driver's seat, slid a snotty look at Ivan and said, This is my zone right here, cat. Stay out of it. But I just turned and whispered into his ears, He doesn't mean that, Ivan. You go wherever you want. Behind the driver's seat were two rows of bus seats, the only ones that Rodeo had left in when he converted it to a full-time residence. Behind the second row was Rodeo's blanket pile on one side and our kitchen area on the other. We didn't have running water or anything, so it was really just a cupboard and a counter and a big cooler where we kept milk and stuff. Ivan seemed especially interested in the cupboards of food, but I kept us moving. Next to the kitchen was our garden, which was a shelf against the window that had a bunch of tomatoes and lettuce and stuff growing in pots. I also had a couple of pots of sunflowers going, and they were looking great. About four feet tall, and each one holding up a gorgeous bursting yellow flower that leaned over toward the sunlight. I don't think there's about a darn thing in the whole world that's more happy and hopeful than a big blooming sunflower. Ivan, sniffing and batting at the nearest bloom, seemed to agree. He's a smart one. Across from the garden was a big bolted -in armchair we called the throne. I can personally vouch that it is a fantastic reading chair, soft enough to lean your head back and relax, or big enough that you can lay sideways and drape your legs over one of the arms if you feel like it. It was conveniently located next to our main bookshelves, which were always crammed full with a rotating selection of me and Rodeo's favorite books. In front of the shelf was the couch, a giant, cushy flower print number. It was ancient and threadbare, and most of the springs had been broken since the 80s. It was hideous and monstrous and absolutely perfect. It was the kind of couch you could stretch out on, and then all of a sudden you wake up and it's an hour later, and you never even realize you were falling asleep. Then, of course, there was my room. 
I got the whole back of the bus, with the dangling curtain giving me my privacy and space. It wasn't big, but it was mine. It had room for me and my bed and a bookshelf and my clothes, and since that was all the stuff I had, that was all the space I needed. And that's it, I said, plopping down on the couch with Ivan. Your new home, what do you think? Ivan's baby blues were looking right into mine. He rubbed up against my chin and uh, rubbed up against my chin and purred, which I took as a stamp of approval. I could see pretty soon that Rodeo was getting fond of Ivan, though he sure tried to hide it from me. The first time Ivan tried to settle into Rodeo's lap while he was driving, Rodeo made a big deal about pushing him off and griping about it. Later, though, I looked up from where I was reading and saw Ivan curled up in Rodeo's lap, eyes all closed and happy, with Rodeo's dirty fingernails scratching at his head. I wanted to jump up and gloat about it, but I knew better. I'd won a battle, but it was best to hold off till I'd won the war. Ivan soon found his favorite spot for when we were on the move. He stretched out right up on the dashboard, pressed, against, pressed up against the windshield, basking in the sunlight and lazily looking back and forth between Rodeo singing behind the wheel and the world blurring by outside the window. Rodeo acted like he hardly noticed his new driving partner, but sitting close one morning, I heard Rodeo mutter when Ivan ambled up and leaped into his spot, Oh, there you are. And I smiled wide, but kept the little victory to myself. Then there was this. The night before we hit 500 miles, we were camping on a dirt road in the middle of nowhere, somewhere outside Steamboat Springs, Colorado. We'd had a fine night, singing together by a campfire with Rodeo strumming away at his guitar and me at my ukulele, soaking in the coolness of the night air and the spectacle of the stars shimmering above us. Ivan sat on my lap the whole time, dozing or blinking into the fire. When it was shut-eye time, though, I somehow lost track of him and all the in and out of getting our chairs and whatnot back aboard the bus. And like that, he was gone, without a trace. I was just about sick, running all around, shouting his name, throwing all sorts of fits. Finally, Rodeo got me calmed down and put me to bed, telling me he was sure I had to be back by morning once his belly got empty. I couldn't sleep, of course, but knelt on my bed with my head sticking out my bedroom window, whispering his name into the night. That's what you do, right? When someone you love is gone, you call their name out into the darkness? Then, just like that, I heard him, meowing up at the front door. My heart was a sugary burst of fireworks, and I bolted for the front, but stopped short at my doorway curtain, because I saw that Rodeo had beat me there. The bus was dark, except for the small yellow glow of Rodeo's bedside lamp. He already had the door open, and I saw his head disappear as he bent down to pick up Ivan. He shut the door and stepped up by the steering wheel, and I saw that he was holding Ivan close, tied up against his chest, and then he dropped his mouth to kiss the top of Ivan's head. Then... Just barely across that dark distance, I heard Rodeo murmur, Welcome back, compadre. You had us worried sick, buddy. Rodeo gave him another kiss and set him down gentle, and I slipped back behind my curtain. I was smiling to myself in the shadows. Us. Huh. Now that us was really pretty darn interesting. Yes, siree, it was. The thing was one, and I knew it right then, and it was only a matter of waiting for the odometer to make it official. A minute later, Ivan poked his nose through the curtain, and then the rest of him followed, and he jumped up and joined me on my bed. I grinned at him and scratched his stupid, wandering away and worrying me sick little head. Ivan, guiltless and unapologetic as a cast flush con man, closed his eyes and leaned into my fingers. Well, Ivan, I whispered, I think you did it. I think you found yourself a home. And sure enough, he had. Because this was how it all played out. We rolled right through Ivan's 500-mile moment, and we didn't say a darn thing. We just kept rolling. Ivan right there with us, and that's just how it was. We both knew it, of course. I'd pointed it out that morning when we'd started driving. 400 miles, Rodeo, I'd said. Ivan hit 500 this afternoon, likely. Rodeo, <coughs> Rodeo sipped from his styrofoam cup of coffee. Mmm, was all he said, blinking all slow and acting sleepy like it wasn't a big freaking deal. We'd taken our time that day, not really racking up the miles. Stopped for a long lunch, dawdled in a tree-shaded park, pulled over for a swim in a muddy river. But then, well after lunch and close to dinner, it happened. The odometer ticked right over the number we both knew was exactly 500 bigger than it had been when we'd had that early morning bleeding neck conversation. It was a number I'll remember to my dying day. 248,845. I was not so casually leaning over Rodeo's seat when that last little white five rolled onto the meter, then held my breath 
for Ivan's last mile, eyeing that digit till my eyes burned from not blinking, and then it did it. Ticked from five to a beautiful six. That was it. Ivan had ridden with us for 500 miles. I looked out the side of my eye at Rodeo, who was still sitting there all nonchalant, one hand draped over the steering wheel, the other picking at something between his teeth. Rodeo? Hmm? I opened my mouth, ready to just flat out ask, but then I reined myself in. Rodeo was well aware we'd hit 500. He was playing possum, and I knew from experience that Rodeo was sometimes best approached in a sideways direction. I cracked my knuckles and looked away, playing my own casualness against his. Give me a once upon a time, I said lightly. I saw him hide a smile in his beard. All right, let's see. He screwed up his eyes and thought and took a swig of root beer. Then he nodded and switched off the radio. Okay, honey. <clears throat> okay, honey cake. Here we go. Once upon a time, there was a crow and a sparrow. The sparrow was a pretty little thing with bright eyes and a sweet nature and the prettiest song he ever heard. The crow, though, he was an ornery old cuss. He'd lost one eye, and he was missing feathers here and there, and he had a wing that was busted and all bent, so he couldn't fly. He just hung around in their old tree, singing with the sparrow and eating whatever measly bugs he could find in the branches. But they were tight, these two, and through wind and rain and, heck, even hurricanes, those two stuck together. Rodeo took another swallow of his root beer, and Ivan chose that opportune moment to come toddling up with a yawn and hop up on Rodeo's lap. Rodeo didn't even look down, but he scratched gruffly at Ivan's head and kept talking and didn't chew him down. So one day, old crow sees something down there on the ground under the tree. It's, it's a french fry. A french fry? I asked dubiously. Yeah, it's a french fry. Dropped, no doubt, by some careless girl with bad habits such as dropping french fries and interrupting stories. So old crow decides to go get this wayward fry. But he can't fly, right? So he hops down branch to branch. And then finally that last long drop to the earth, and he lands with one hell of a clumsy crash. But he grabs it and looks up and realizes, well, crap, I should have thought that through. He's feeling pretty hopeless down there, flightless and stranded. But then who shows up? A hungry fox, I guessed. No, it ain't that gruesome a story. It's Sparrow, of course. And that Sparrow, well, she was something else. All heart, that one. And she got right under big old crotchety, broken-winged crow, and she beat her wings something fierce. And at first, nothing happened. But then Crow, he started flapping his wings, too, best he could anyway. And with the help of that remarkable little Sparrow, Darned if that old crow didn't fly again for the first time in a long time, right up into the branches of that tree. And there they sat, the crow and the sparrow, side by side, up in the bright blue sky where they belonged, sharing that french fry. The end. I nodded thoughtfully. Not bad, Rodeo, not bad. That crow must have sure loved french fries, though. Rodeo shook his head. No, nah, he said, scratching the diving's head. He didn't at all, really. What? Then why'd he flop all the way down to the ground to get one? Rodeo looked down at the perfect kitten in his lap, then back out at the highway, winding its way through Colorado's pine trees. Because the sparrow loved french fries, coyote, and the crow loved the sparrow. I smiled then just to myself and sat back in my seat and blew out a big sigh. I'd been kind of holding in since that odometer had ticked over to that magic number. That rodeo, he's something else. From time to time, he can be darn near clever and poetic in spite of himself. And that's the end of chapter four. A quiet, soft little chapter, but an important one, because now we know that she gets to keep Ivan. Ivan is a part of their family now, and he's on the bus. <clears throat> and we see that rodeo is not such a mean, tough guy like he pretends sometimes. Okay. I promise by the end of this day, uh, which is Thursday, March 19th, um, I will post the rest of it because I know if, if you're actually listening to these, hoping to be part of the book club and you're waiting for your book to come that uh, if I wait too long, it's not going to be worth it and it's not gonna, you're not going to have time to finish it by the time we get together. So that's my job today. I'll get the next, I think, I forget, three chapters done. Um, in the meantime, I finished the last couple with book talks and I like doing that. Um, the books I'm talking about today, I couldn't find my copies. Um, so I'm just going to... Uh, try to make the covers flash on the screen. Um, 
I managed to make that work in video one, so I should know how to do it for video two. Um, but the first one I'm going to talk about is called Ice Dogs by Terry Lynn Johnson. Looks like this. Fantastic outdoor adventure survival story. Awesome girl main character. Um, it's sled dogs. It's danger. It's life or death stuff. Really, really, really fun story that I could not put down and that I think you will not be able to put down too. Just a really great adventure story. And again, when we're kind of in these situations where we're kind of stuck inside, um, it's great to have a book that helps us escape, that takes us to somewhere else and whisks us away. Um, and that's the book that will whisk you away for sure. Um, and the second book I highly recommend you try to get from your library or whatever in these weeks home from school is called Midnight Without a Moon by Linda Williams Jackson. Amazing story. Very different than Ice Dogs. It's set back in the past in the South about a girl in really challenging circumstances circumstances and she's trying to get an education. Um, there's people trying to stop that. She's dealing with poverty. She's dealing with racism. Um, it's about family. It's about culture. It's about race. It's about lots of things. But the main character is just so strong and just a character you will cheer for and root for through all the hard stuff she has to go through. Um, and it's just a beautiful story, beautifully told. Um, and there's a sequel, which is just as good as Sky Full of Stars, I think. Um, so Midnight Without a Moon by Linda Williams Jackson is just a really, really great story. Um, I 10 out of 10. Two thumbs up for me for sure. So Ice Dogs by Terry Lynn Johnson and Midnight Without a Moon by Linda Williams Jackson. Uh, two of my very favorites um, and you should check them out. Again, I'll post very soon the following chapters of The Remarkable Journey of Coyote Sunrise. Hope you're doing great. Uh, me and Odie. Odie is now asleep. He sleeps a lot. Um, hope you're having a great break and yep, I will see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.